quiet seaside town, an evil lain to rest centuries ago, has risen. An abandoned fortress deep in the swamp holds a secret that could save the village or destroy it. Now, a band of adventurers sets out to dig up the wounds of the past and bring the light of day to the roots of ruin. This is Tabletop Gold. Hello, friends, and welcome to Tabletop Gold, episode 146 of The Roots of Ruin. My name is Lars Castine. Welcome to the, whoa, my voice blew out. Welcome hey. to the show. Hey, I've got a little bit of a cold. It means that, like, if I'm down here in the lower register, everything's fine. But if I'm up here, I turn into Bobcat Goldthwaite real fast. <laughs> a little bit of an issue. Uh, I'm Lars Castine. Welcome to the show. I'm joined tonight, as always, by Robin Lang. Good that time, Lars and listeners. Good that time. Armat Humphreys. Good that time. Zoe uh, trying, trying to little. Oh, what are you trying to do? Sorry. What what are you doing? I don't know. I was trying to infuse it with like a little like jingly vibe, I guess. Can I can I tell it, you something? It was yeah. so natural that I didn't even know you were doing anything. I I just yeah. felt good to me. Like and you're like, good that time. I was just like, nice. Yeah, I had a bit of like See, the announcer from Price is Right. I liked it. Yeah, Thank you were you. a little bit yeah. a little bit of a roddy rod tonight. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Oh, very exciting. But do anyway, Zoe, sorry to interrupt. Oh, no, it's all good. Zoe Chernikoff is here. I it feels like a lot of pressure to follow up, but good. Good that time, everyone. Good that time. And David, the Tin Man Chernikoff is here as well. Good that time. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. He's on fire. The national broadcast. OK, I'm going to go again. Is. No, I'm uh, kidding. OK, <laughs> OK. <laughs> Um, we've got a lot of fun stuff going on in the game today. We've got a level up conversation. Very exciting. We're breaking into book three, if not tonight, then very soon. We're basically at the end wow. of book two of the Abomination Vaults. Very exciting. Lots of exciting things happening. But before we do that, I just want to tell a little bit of a, of a story, if that's okay. I, do you ever have moments where you realize that you're experiencing like a small, just pure moment of joy? There's something joyous happening around you and you didn't expect it it just sort of like comes out of nowhere it's a little bit of a maybe some people would call it a blessing potentially i don't i don't know if that's exactly what i would call it this doesn't ring a bell but go on okay i was at the bodega in my neighborhood the other day and i was there because for, for something like i we were running out of coffee and i needed to buy more coffee or something like that and i was standing in line at the bodega behind uh a man in a business suit, like a, a businessman who had bought like a bottle of water and whatever else at the store underneath, like in the front counter, right by the cash register, there's just a bunch of chocolate, like different chocolate bars. Like, um, they have like Ritter sports. They have those Tony chocolate, chocolate lonely. You know what I'm talking about? I don't even know yeah. what that is. Yeah. They've got chocolates and it's this is chocolate. Yeah. It's the and Ritter things the john ritter endorsed yes bar? they are what they are it's like, yeah. what paul R. newman R. did for salad dressing john ritter did for <laughs> chocolate bars <laughs> uh, give her. absolutely but um this man as he was like checking out like took a step a step back he's wearing this suit and he's and he looked at a chocolate bar and he reached for the biggest chocolate bar he could get and he accidentally knocked like nine chocolate bars onto the floor in front of him and then he frantically started getting down on his knees oh, and picking up no. the chocolate and trying to put it back on the shelf and knocking more chocolate on the floor. <laughs> and he was just like tr trying so hard to take this like little thing and keep it little. And it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and it was it was just such a joyous moment for me watching this dude like struggle to get the chocolate back on the stand and have it fall on the floor. And um, I'm just wondering. Um, no, because <laughs> in, in honesty, why ruin it? It, lo it looked right. Why ruin it? One, you don't want to gild a lily, 
But two, uh, it looked really difficult what he was doing. Like mm-hmm. it, the chocolate bars mm-hmm. were stacked up in a very precarious sort of pyramid sort of structure. Like it's, in it's my certainly, head, each one is the size of like a boogie board as well. Kind of those Tony Chocoloni things are like this big. They're like wonk. It's like a it's like a prop from a movie or something. I also imagine it's like the peak. Too many cooks in the kitchen. Like someone else tries to help, and it just gets even worse. Right. I don't think this guy would have appreciated my involvement in this in the in the thing if I had like gotten down and been like. Let me help you. <laughs> and then, like, you know what probably would have been Let worse? me help you, small man. <laughs> Which I'm assuming you didn't do is if you just kind of like cheered him on. Be like, you can do it, bud. You're almost <laughs> there, man. You got, you got this. Yeah, you got this. Hey, we're all we're all in it together. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in it from back here. All right, uh... we're all experiencing this, dude. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Do, do, do you have small moments of joy like that? Am I am I a bad person for enjoying this? May, I, like, it, it was just such a. It was like seeing a like a like a silent comedy just unfolding in 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 front of my eyes. That's what it you know? makes me think of. Is like the the purity of it is just from. It's it's like the simplest kind of funny. It's just like something falling over. Yeah, and sometimes it's nice when just. Dumb, uncomplicated, amusing things happen. And, but they're not, I mean, it's when you drop your whatever all over the place, it's awful. So, somebody else doing it, it's, it's, it's delightful. It's so nice. Is it bad that when you're asking, like, do you get this feeling in life yourself? Mm. That I immediately went to the joy you feel when you see someone like speeding past you and swerving in and out of traffic and you get a mile ahead and you see they're pulled over to get a mm. ticket. Mm. It's yeah. very, it's very <laughs> similar. That feels to slightly that. more punitive, right? But I, I, I <laughs> think they're the in like, the same family of feelings. Yeah, like Lars's was kind of a pure joy. Like no one really did anything wrong. Absolutely it was just not. this kind of funny thing that happened versus like you see someone doing something very wrong and no one gets hurt. But you're glad that they got their comeuppance for it. Right. Well, there's a sense of relief when you see that car on the side of the road. Whereas um, I had no relief when this man just was joy. throwing chocolate. <laughs> just joy. It was just <laughs> joy. Guys. That's interesting. You you associate the person being f- pulled over with relief because it means that like the hazard is off the road. Yes. I'm much more in the Robin. This Maybe this is one of these Rorschachy things. I'm much more in the Robin camp where the the like feeling of uplift that I get from it is not, oh good, we're all safer. It's like, okay, here's a proof point for the concept of justice, which otherwise <laughs> is is being belied everywhere I look. <laughs> exactly. Oh, totally. So so in to some extent it's like the universe is correcting itself. Like like things are operating in a way that makes you feel okay. I love rule following. And I love when other people follow rules and people don't follow rules. I love when there's a consequence. Interesting. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about that is interesting? <laughs> like what? <laughs> well, I was, I immediately thought of a, a question that got posed in a friend group many years ago, which is, uh, this is like the ultimate kind of rule follower test, which I think is a good personality litmus test. So let's just do it. On an airplane, when they make an announcement, like, please put your phone in airplane mode, do you stop what you're doing and do it immediately? I do. I do it within 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah. I do it I finish up what I'm doing and do it. Armat? Be- I've usually done it once I'm on the plane and I've, like, Oh, you're, texted. like, as soon as you sit down, you just get it taken care of. Yeah, pretty much. But, Same. Um, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm prepped. I know it's coming. I don't want to have to react to it. I'll just take care of that. In my own time. Yeah. For a long time, I was probably closer to like the Robin and Lars thing. And then at some point, someone made the point to me that like, obviously, if your phone isn't on airplane mode and that was really a problem for them, they just wouldn't let us have cell phones, right? Like, if right. it's truly the case that airplane mode is required, they would be going through and like actually confiscating devices. And I have to admit, I, I mean, I do eventually do it, but like, <laughs> if I'm doing something else or if it, like within, you know, within five to ten minutes i do it like i don't not do it at all but like it's gonna be fine yeah i once actually um was on a not a far flight some i was going from country to country in europe and i had accidentally left my phone in my chat in my overhead luggage and so this is before you know iphones or anything so it wasn't it's not like i needed it on the flight as i got off the flight i realized my phone's been on 
regular on this right. whole time, and yeah. everything was fine. Yeah, like, this is like your rum spring on. <laughs> so I thought you were going to say your phone rang at some point in the flight, <laughs> which t- totally hypocritically of me. If that happened on the plane, I'd be furious in flight. Like I don't if someone around me's phone service, rang. Though mm. no, I don't. I think don't so think either. that we're. I think that we may be making a slightly faulty set of assumptions about the nature of the threat here oh like, i'm sure i don't know anything if, about the threat it's not that if there is a cell phone enabled on an airplane immediately the airplane's communication systems like brick and like and it can't navigate. do we know that for sure okay. we don't i know. don't well i guess per, per robin's story we do have one cat one like right. data point suggesting well, what if that's the only time that's ever happened yeah <laughs> yeah now we got that 5g which you, gets into your you brain know what, yeah. your teeth you're you know, absolutely so. right Never mind. <laughs> uh, no, it's like I think it, it, there's like a mar- some marginal chance that there's some cro- so like why it's more like a why risk it. My brain always goes to uh, one of the opening se- one of the first scenes, the first moments in that first episode ever of West Wing, where Toby's on a plane and he's trying to answer a cell phone call and the woman's yelling at him and he then starts like giving all the all the actual data on like what type of plane this is and he's like saying and you're saying that my little dumb phone here that i picked up at radio shack is gonna damage your communications yeah nowadays that's how you get yourself arrested yeah that's right that's that's true (laughs) that's how you end up spending a whole lot of time in a very small room in an airport hey you know you know what else (laughs) uh involves spending a whole lot of time um doing a thing is listening to this podcast and uh the people that have spent a lot of time listening to this podcast have uh taken the uh the really kind step of leaving reviews for our show on various podcast uh, applications one thing i'd like to bring up is a review that uh hardly no m left on apple podcasts here's what they said they said, I really love the adversarial relationships the players have with the editor, and I hope everyone continues to talk about slating in, is, is the, the, the note. Oh, I'm so, I feel so bad. We don't slate in anymore. Yeah, we don't really slate We have a whole new often. recording system. Yeah. We could start. We could slate now. Anybody want to slate? David? David Slate? David, David Slate Slate? Why are you saying it so many times? <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, th- slate. <laughs> thank you, Hardly No M, for that review. It's super helpful and super kind. So thank you so much. Uh, and with that, what do you say we get into it? What do you say if we play our game? Let's do it. Let's do it. Oh. <laughs> you. He did it. He did the thing. <laughs> he did the thing. <laughs> Mwah. Perfection. It's the month of Erastus, and summer has brought its usual changes to the town of Otari. Children play in the shallows of the inner sea. Vendors sell fresh fruit from stands set up on its cobble streets. And the workers at the giant's wheel have taken to short sleeves. In the dungeons deep below the swamp to the north, though, this new month has brought some unexpected changes. An army of devils has left. A cadre of flesh warpers has been disbanded and a gargantuan monstrosity lurking in an ancient arena has been destroyed. As the heroes responsible for these new developments, you know you still have a long ways to go before the threat to this small town is eliminated. The spirit of the ancient sorcerer Belcora Haravex still dwells somewhere even deeper below ground, and it will take preparation, forethought, and planning to make sure she is never able to complete her life's mission, to find vengeance in the city of Absalom's destruction. It's the end of book two. We're done with book two of this adventure path. Vanessa Hoskins, who wrote this uh, this book, which is called something. I don't know. What was this book called? Who's to say? The one who's right? got it. <laughs> it was, it was, it was, a, a little, give me a second, guys. I'm going to look this up. Anyway, Vanessa wrote the book and uh, we know what it was called. We're just joking around, right? We know what, we all know what it was. 
that's what it was. More two abomination, two vault. It was called Hands of the Devil. Hands oh, of Hands the of the Devil. Devil. That makes sense. Yeah. That yes. makes sense. That's Ooh, a good name. Totally. There were both Thanks, devils Vanessa. and hands. So oh, that yeah. means. Oh my gosh, so many hands. I didn't even make that there connection. There were a lot of hands now. That a, lot of hands. a lot of hands. Yeah, so we're about to break into book three, which is called Eyes of Empty Death by Stephen oh, no. Radney McFarlane. Okay, so that tells me okay. there's going to be Nimbleoth. Okay. And okay. there's going to be eyes. Yeah. That's yeah. what I got from yeah. that. Nimbleoth staring us down. What was book one called? Was book one called the the, the Something Otari? Like, body part of threatening entity? Like, yeah, it was called Jeff's, Jeff's Head is what it was called. <laughs> Wow. Um, we never found it. Don't oh, no. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, it was called Ruins of Gauntlet by James Jacobs. Okay. Checks out. Roots um, of Ruin, yeah. But yeah, this is a three-book adventure, so we're about to go into the third of three books. It's the beginning of the end of the beginning. <gasps> well, beginning of the end. No. no. No, no, no. It's the no, beginning. No, no, no. It's nowhere near the there. beginning of the end, officially. Of the beginning of the end. Oh, the, we oh can it's go the to beginning four of the now? beginning of the end. Oh. Yeah, that makes sense. Beginning of the beginning of the end. Wait, we haven't okay. ever done I this like bit it. on mic, have we? This is just us. No, we haven't. <laughs> Wait, this was off <laughs> of <laughs> Guys, yeah. we have spent lots of minutes doing this. You just never got to hear it before. Yeah. We talked a lot about how the last few episodes were the end of the middle. The end of the end of the middle, I think, was what we determined. <laughs> anyway, it doesn't matter. End. Of the beginning of the end. I think it was so, the end so, of the end of the beginning, and now we're at the beginning of the beginning of the end. We're well, at the no, beginning of the beginning of the middle. Well, the middle has long gone. Coming gone. That's in the rear view. That's uh, that's the caboose that we've just detached from this train. The uh, that's a figure of speech that a lot of people use. Yep. So the thing yep. that we want to um talk about right now is level ups. Everybody leveled up to level eight. Let's uh, let's 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 just discuss some of these big choices. Uh, I'm going to start with Zoe. Ao oh. um got a bunch of stuff because you're uh because you're a rogue. And that means you get tons of stuff that happens to you every level. Um, let's let's talk about a few of these things. Is there anything that jumps out from your choices that you would like to discuss? I can throw a thing your way if you don't have anything. You hit, hit me up with what you think the, uh, the listeners want to hear about. Um, sure. I'm down to take your guidance. Sure. The uh, let's let's see. Oh, okay. You get a new spell because you have the sorcerer archetype. And right. you are, and you're retraining a spell. My new spell that I am taking is a level three spell, and so I've shifted away a little bit from the do damage spell, which I think we've all seen in action either does no damage or does so little damage as to basically do no damage in effect. <laughs> Sometimes you roll really, really well, and then you do do you do two damage. That's with right. Your spells. I do do a little bit of damage. Um, so I'm going to make myself feel good instead. Uh, and to that end, for my level three spell, I am taking Roaring Applause, uh, mm. which means that when I do something particularly exciting, uh, there will be the, the feeling that there is an audience around me cheering and applauding, whatever it is that I've chosen to do, which just feels right. I think for Ao, but particularly for Norman, the idea that there would be this sort of magical conjuring of um, laudits for, for the entire thing. Uh, I can target someone, the target attempts will save, and I have to say, once before this show ends, I want one target to critically fail. Uh, at a success, the target is um, mildly distracted, it can't use reactions. At a failure, I, uh, the target starts applauding me so vigorously that it can't use reactions and is slowed one. <laughs> um, it's so the, good. The applause has the manipulate trait, uh, and that uh, happens at the start of the target's turn. And at a critical failure, all those things are true. And the target is so distracted by vigorously applauding me that it is fascinated with me. Uh, that's awesome. Which just it's feels so that's really good. Yeah. That's a whole lot of value right There's, there. I mean, the, the you know, if nothing else, the flavor value feels worth it. That's all the other spells really were anyways. So a lot of swearing. I think, I think there'll be less swearing now, which I'm... You know, sad for all the uh, children out there that they won't get to learn these words through our Yeah, broadcast. they'll never learn them now. This is going to be the end of profanity. <laughs> they'll just die it. out like yeah. Latin. It's a fucking shame. <laughs> <laughs> I also retrained Teeth to Terror, which is my level two spell, which is one of the ones that um, had a lot of fun flavor to it, but did basically nothing. And I'm taking Phantom Crowd, 
which allows me uh, a two action spell that will create a an illusory crowd that is difficult terrain for anyone who hasn't disbelieved the illusion. I don't know. Maybe they're applauding. Maybe they're not. Wow. Uh, you can't actually understand what they're saying. Everyone like creatures have to spend an action to try and disbelieve them. Um, and you know, there's varying conditions. Presumably, the dungeon's not going to be a great place for everyone believing. Long term, there's a crowd, but I just liked the idea that uh, in her fascination with illusions and and the like that AO might just start conjuring 50 or 60 people to be participating in things with everyone. I'm really I, glad you took those because they were ones I was looking at for Trill, but I feel like the way Trill's character development has gone, it didn't quite make sense anymore um, for her to like want such a, be so focused on like a crowd of people cheering her performance on. Um, so I'm really glad that they're still, that they've, they've made their way into the game. And though. I see no reason when Trill is performing that the crowd might not be one more song, one more song. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Teamwork. It makes the dream work. Yeah. So those, those mm -hmm. are my two spell swaps or well, new spell and spell swap. Um, that sounds good. There's one thing I want to talk about before we move on. One more thing, because I, I, I think it's gonna, I think it's gonna come up and I want to sort of set the stage for it. Cause it's something I haven't seen before in a game. And that is your class feat that you picked. Are you are you up for talk for discussing that one? The class feat, not the skill feat. The class feat, yeah. Okay, um, this is one I am excited about. Uh, so it's called Inspire Strateg Inspired Strategium. It's a reaction. I didn't have any real reactions, so that's exciting. Um, every day at my daily preparations, uh, I have to like sit down with, I can sit down with all three of you and sort of go over strategy and talk things over. So we shouldn't get too drunk or maybe we should, I don't know. Um, and then as anyone is rolling an attack or skill check, it basically works like Drew Strike. Like I get the ability to give you, each of you once a day, get to roll Ooh. twice and take the better of that roll. It feels really uplifting and teamworky, but I also really like the idea that AO is going to be like super snide about this. Like, Isten, don't do it that way. And sort of, you know, use it to, <laughs> right. to kind of sorry, like... Trill. I'm... Sorry, Trill. Sorry, you. Coach people into whatever she thinks they should be doing. So I'm, I'm excited. Yeah. I was about to say that seems far too teamworky for AO. Well, we found a way to <laughs> make it Until you fit. put it that way. Yeah. Right. It's more backseat driving than it is. It's more else. manipulative. <laughs> it's that's my strategium that you'll be inspired by. Uh, so that's, that's awesome. We're going to keep some things uh, secret until they come out. But let's move on, shall we, to... Let's talk to Robin. Tr let's talk about Trill, Hi. the picks for Trill this time. Any of these so... you want to talk about? Fewer things than, than, than yeah. uh, Ao because rogues get... You know, like skills and skill, like so much stuff and spells and all this stuff. But but yeah, what are we looking at? This wasn't a super exciting level up for um, Bard. So for my class feat, I took Harmonize, which why wouldn't I? So Harmonize is a great Bard class feat. Where now I'm going to be able to take an action to cast both um, Dirge of Doom and Courageous Anthem, Ooh. and they don't cancel each other out. Nice. Yeah. Hell yeah. So okay. I'm very excited for that. So you can have two songs going at the same time. I just want to, so that we're doing it now rather than in the middle of a combat. Let's like make sure we really understand how this works because this has come <laughs> up in the past and I've never gotten it. So I'm just going to read the text of this thing. It's, an, it's a one action activity. You can perform multiple compositions simultaneously. If your next action is to cast a composition, it becomes a harmonized composition. So first you spend an action to do harmonize yeah then the next thing that you play is a harmonized composition yeah unlike a normal composition a harmonized composition doesn't end if you cast another composition and you can cast another composition on the same turn as a harmonized one like harmonized like compositions tend to can like cancel each other out if you if you do them simultaneously Exactly. Casting another harmonized composition ends any harmonized composition you have in effect. So like, okay, so how do you how do you use this? So I think essentially it's my entire first turn. Okay. So cast harmonize, cast courageous anthem, cast dirge of doom. Because each of those are one action to cast. I just don't burn that focus point. I see. Could That's you That's my understanding of it. Do you think you could do harmonize, cast courageous anthem and then lingering composition 
into a um, oh, well, dirge of doom. That's a good question because lingering what composition is a composition as well. Yes. So no, sorry, just... lingering composition is not lingering composition. Even though it says composition in it. Yeah, it doesn't have the composition trait. It's a it's a spell shape, I guess, using the new nomenclature. So and then dirge of doom would be a composition. I think what I would I think the way is so order matters here. Yeah. Right. So first harmonize, then one of my two compositions. Right. So then that one is essentially the composition that can be harmonized with. Yeah. So then I do lingering composition into the other composition. And then those two compositions will be harmonized. Yeah. Right? Because it's if your next ca- um, action is to cast a composition, it becomes a harmonized composition. Yeah. Um, and that won't end if I cast another composition. Yeah. So the And thing I that- can cast both on the same turn. Yes. So the thing that it doesn't say, which I think may be, I think it may be implied, is if you have like Dirge of Doom going, being sustained by Lingering Composition, and then you on a later turn, you do a harmonized Courageous Anthem, I don't think that that stops the Dirge of Doom. It doesn't say that explicitly, but I think that if you do harmonize, it doesn't cut off Lingering. I song. think that's true, because it's only casting... So if I cast Harmonize on one, right. then did one, and if I say I had three compositions I could choose from, I can right. only cu- I can only harmonize two of them. Of course, definitely. It con- yeah, so it, um, yeah, because it basically says co- uh, casting another harmonized composition ends any harmonized composition you already have an effect. Right, right. So the okay. harmonized one is, so the one that isn't harmonized stays essentially. Right. And the one that is harmonized is the one that's changeable were I to have three compositions. Okay. Well, now I, now I don't know what you're saying, but I think you're, it makes sense to me. (laughs) Okay, cool. (laughs) Who's Um, on first? Sounds good. Sounds good. So basically it's like you can, you can, um, spend two action because the, the, like inspire courage costs an action and so does dirge of doom. So it's like, if you harmonize, courageous anthem. Sorry, you're correct. I'm looking at Archives of Nethys. Yeah, you're correct. Um, I'm looking at uh, Archives of Nethys, which is updating to remaster rules tomorrow at the time of recording. <laughs> so, but 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 basically, it's like you can have a harmonized deal if you're spending two actions on it. So if you can have two songs active, if you have like a lingering song sticking around, costing you zero actions yes. on future turns. Yes. And then you spend so, two actions to add an additional song. Yeah. So like first round, I could do lingering comp into something and then do something else. Second round, I could do the harmonized. Uh, to add an additional effect yeah. for that round, basically. Exactly. Yeah. So okay. it's kind of like. Because the harmonized, because that's the tricky thing. The harmonized is not, does not linger. Right. Correct. You have to pick harmonizing or lingering. Yeah. Congratulations. So that, that's the thing I hadn't thought about. That's where we got to figure it out. That's yeah, that's good, where it's that's, that's where call. it gets technical. This is that's yes. that's sort of why I'm trying to dive into this, and, and I hope the people at home are enjoying that are enjoying this. You know, uh, the whole exchange made me realize something. What's that? I may never play a caster in this game. <laughs> well, you okay. So here's the thing, is if you play a caster, you don't have to take harmonize. Like, you don't have to do this specific thing, which is, this is a little, this is very juggling-y. This is very, like, yeah. I've got this ball up in the air for three rounds, and now I'm tossing this other ball, like, if like once every six seconds. It's it's a little, you know. I will I'm, say from experience. I'm leading into the complication. There are a bunch of useless spells you can take and only use sometime <laughs> to no effect. So there's lots of different ways to do it. Yeah, David, you should consider that route if you ever want to open that door. I can't wait to one day finally wrap my head around playing like a witch or something. <laughs> um, oh, witches are so cool. Witches are, witches are all right. Um, well, I'm glad that we did that because I, I do think it's like in the middle of combat, I'm not going to want to... I'm not going to want to figure that out. So, and yeah, I think that was a good, all of the discussion there was good. Thank you for that. So, that was my harmonize. Um, Skill feat, I'm excited about only because you were really uh, bummed that I took it. Yeah. (laughs) That's a good reason. Uh, My skill feat, I took Battle Cry. Yeah. So, when I roll initiative, Trill can yell a mighty battle cry and demoralize an observed foe as a free action. Um, And anytime I use demoralize, because I have. Uh, which one is it? Versatile uh, performance. Because I have versatile performance, I get to ra- use my performance to roll demoralize, and my performance is now off the charts. Yeah, now ridiculous. that I'm level eight, 
So it's almost like at the beginning of a combat, you play like the scariest chord imaginable and it just mm, melts bop. the brain. <laughs> you do one of the mm, yeah. bop, doo wop. <laughs> It's, it's like the first chord in Hard Day's I, Night, but just incredibly it's loud. It's that <laughs> one. Um, sadly, <laughs> since I don't actually like have intimidation as a skill, right. I don't get the extra bonus of Battle Cry, which says if you're legendary in intimidation, you can use a reaction to demoralize your foe when you critically succeed at any attack roll. <laughs> but Trill also doesn't really do att- attack rolls, so that's doesn't well, really apply. I think, so Versatile Performance has this sentence that says, you can use your proficiency rank in performance to meet re- the requirements of skill feats that require a particular rank in deception, diplomacy, or intimidation. So it's like a little oh, bit of an edge case, maybe, whether that applies. Like, Well, let's uh, wait and let's uh, make the decision, I guess, when I get to legendary and performance. Well, the good news is that will never happen because no! our campaign will be over before then. <laughs> that so, is. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's Trill's upgrade. Phenomenal. Uh, David, let's talk about Mag. What is Mag looking at for this level? So, uh, yes, I got a class feat and a skill feat as yeah. well. Um, the skill feat, I took something called Quick Swim, which, let me get into the text here, makes me swim quicker. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a good. Uh-huh. Very, I, I like it. Yeah. That's what it says in the tin. Five, five feet greater uh, swim speed on a success. Um, I guess a successful swim swim roll swim check swim yeah swim swim why what roll wait you have to swim every turn so you've got to be rolling athletics, athletics yeah. to do it okay so if I succeed at that check I can swim five feet farther than I otherwise would or or if I critical critically succeed ten feet farther yeah. um yeah so typically you would swim ten feet on a success now you can swim fifteen, 15. And typically you would swim 15 feet on a critical success, but now you will potentially swim um, 25 feet. So in still water, you're going to be beating, like this. The, the DC for still water is like 10. So you're going to be critically succeeding on that pretty effortlessly. Yep. So Mag is, is potentially a lot faster in the water now. Yes, and I uh, it, it, there was not a ton in the skill feet like in the available skill feats that I was super drawn to, this one felt kind of cool to combine or like not combine. Well, I guess combine with mechanically, but also just flavor wise. It was like, okay, having her just be very aquatically committed um, kind of seemed like it made sense for the character as well as potentially being useful because we keep needing yeah. to swim around and, and deal with baddies in the water. So that's the skill feat. Um, and then the class feat that I took, um, it was interesting listening to Robin describe the way her battle cry works with her versatile performance that she's just taking this thing. It lets her demoralize. She already has something built into the character that when she demoralizes, you know, something, something special and beneficial happens. I feel like there's kind of an analogous thing happening with this class feat. I took the class feat furious bully while raging. I gain a plus two to athletics checks for attack actions in combat. So if I am trying to trip something, grab something, disarm, shove. I already have a class feat called Slam Down, which is a two action attack that um, if I make a melee strike and hit and do damage, I can then attempt an athletics check to trip the creature that I hit without taking a multiple attack penalty. So that's really good on its own because it lets you do this second attack without the minus five map but now that i have this furious bully thing not only will i not be taking a minus five penalty to that trip uh when i slam down i will get a plus two circumstance bonus so it's like better than tripping in the first place basically <laughs> that's yeah. awesome um, yeah that's it is up. that works out it is it it <laughs> is pretty um it may end up being kind of messed up so yeah that's that's mag. We're we're steering further into uh, the strengths here, which are um, splashing around and hitting stuff. Yeah, I think it also makes sense. Like living on a coastal town with like rivers and things running through it, that mag would be a very good swimmer. Yes, totally. swamp floor, right? She's been mucking swamp about floor. in the in the water. Armet, let's talk. Let's let's talk turkey. Let's get into it. We got a skill feat. We got a class feat. We got some spells. What are we? I don't even know what spells you took. We haven't even discussed that. 
Yeah. So what, what um, do we, we want to start there then? Um, start wherever you want to start. Let's just talk about so, anything that you think is exciting to talk about. I, I'm pretty excited about these new spells. I took a spell called Weapon Storm, uh, which can either be a 30 foot cone or a 10 foot emanation. Mm. And it's basically mm. like Istin swings his staff and then like a mass of like replicated versions of his staffs appear in the cone or in the emanation um and like hit everything in the the area of effect with a uh, bludgeoning damage that's so, so um, good cool. it's gonna be really what fun. a perfect and spell for like, then yeah and just like it's so flavorful the like idea of that like all of a sudden your your war mage is like throwing all of his weapons out at people is pretty cool it's like the opposite of whack-a-mole there's one mole <laughs> and a ton of sticks yeah exactly and then the other spell i took was wall of fire for some like battlefield control i figured that could yeah. be kind of fun and be useful in some tactical scenarios so um that'll that'll kind of get me uh to play uh boy boy tactician uh a little bit which will be fun um so i was pretty excited about both it's Danabel hollis um, boy tactician <laughs> <laughs> oh my god i think somewhere it's thin's ears just turned red in delight like um uh and um the skill feed i took is also like sort of more leaning into the spellcastery side of things i took magical shorthand which basically drops the learn a spell requirements from spending an hour per spell level to about 10 minutes per spell level so he'll be able to learn a lot faster when we have downtime which uh, may or may not come up at some point soon yeah um or if you find a spell book in the dungeon or something like that ooh. you can just you can just grab those things without totally. even slowing down too much exactly. speed reader and then the last thing was um uh, i think Istin has been inspired by watching mag fight and so he now has a reactive strike as well yes oh. yeah Good. Does Which, that with trigger reach is going to be strike. really fun. Now it does <laughs> twice. Yeah. Oh gosh, there's so like, be a moment when they can do a reactive strike one after another. Yeah. Like, perfect like, balletic uh, combination. Boom, yeah. Boom. Like, for instance, let's just say when AO successfully casts Roaring Applause, the target gets slowed and starts clapping. And then at the beginning of that target's turn, <laughs> it gets slammed in the face twice. <laughs> it's so <laughs> fucked up <laughs> like it's uh, not okay this is gonna I'm be like, so good I'm like genuinely irritated by it so um, I, wait so speaking yeah. of it's not okay and it's genuinely irritating if you're trying to run the monsters I, I have sure. to say these well, I'm new to this I've never had a character at level 8 I'd never had one at sure. level 7 or 4 or, this seems <laughs> like a really big step change in capability like, or or I don't know That's if it's something particular yeah. about level eight or if it's just that now we have enough attributes in these characters that they're starting to stack. They're starting to like have resonance with each other right. rather than like, hey, you level up. So you get another thing. And now, you you yeah. know, you're like, all right, I have now I have another like object on the table. It's like, no, these are really starting to like combine and layer and suggest like tactics to you. I, I don't know. This, yeah. this feels like a like a change in 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 kind in some way not 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 just in quantity i think it definitely uh, yeah. also helps that we're actually like as we're doing the level up so off screen of course you know we're in our discord uh we're in the cast and crew discord chatting with each other about what our choices are um we're not all just doing it in a vacuum so there's some some and, party cohesion to because we're all like aware a little bit of where each other is going and how we're building yeah. and what we're thinking there's power to communication man yeah. Mm. And, right. Most of yeah. us are thinking about how we can help each other, and some of us are getting <laughs> monsters to applaud us. <laughs> it's just like the party. It's just like the party. That's right. The I mean, the thing that I'll say is that like Mag staying up late figuring out how she, how she can make stuff off guard to Ao, and Ao staying up late figuring out how she can make the monster skip her an ovation. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So, so the, the two things that I'll say to that, David, and then let's, let's move on yeah. is like, one, uh, I think that that's a thing about this game period 
like people, some of the complaints about Pathfinder Second Edition versus other games of this style is that teamwork is so central to the way that this game works. Like it, it's not like four individuals going out and having like the perfect build and just rolling big numbers. Like it really is a, a lot about setting each other up, paying off these, like just, just by virtue of how the math works. And people, so people, who people some people dislike that. It's some people dislike that because, okay, got it, got it. Yeah, because it's like, I don't get to be good. Especially like people sometimes criticize spell casting because it's like, I don't get to be great as a spellcaster. I have to instead set up the other person to be great is like a common complaint, hmm. um, which there's maybe some validity to, maybe was more validity to it. This idea earlier in this game's lifespan, I think that they've like maybe been addressing that over the, the years since it came out. So it's like, if, if, if people are playing this game for a power fantasy, which a lot of people are, it's like there are sometimes guardrails that are meant to be transcended by team play. And if that's not what you're interested in, then it's like, you just suck. And you're like, why do I suck? You know? Yeah. yeah. I feel like it's it's a cooperative storytelling game that yeah. happens to also be a battle um, <laughs> simulator. But like, if you just want to min-max, there's lots of great video games for that. It's kind of how I look at it personally. And I think you can min-max, but it's more on the party level like you can like yeah, really make exactly. a party that 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 gets it done and then the other thing that i'll say is that i think that this is a feature of this game at this particular range of levels like seven eight nine ten ish is like the number of fantastical things that you can do like suddenly mag is flying around like people are making each other like burst into applause multiple people are are following it like all of this stuff is everyone's like, gonna be afraid Everyone's going to be afraid, <laughs> yeah, like, without even spending actions. It's like, this game is relatively um, constrained at low levels, to, to and it sometimes can be frustrating because it's like, you're more grounded than maybe it, your idea of what a heroic fantasy kind of thing is, but then this range of levels from, like, 7 to 11 or so is the point where everything, like, pivots from where normal people who are trying really hard to the point where, like, by level 20, you're, you're like, demigods who can, like, do just completely astounding things all the time. And this this range of levels that we're playing through right now is kind of that pivot point. And for that reason, I personally find this range of levels to be one of the more exciting and interesting to play in because it's, like, this is where really wild stuff starts coming online, which is, I think, exciting. Yeah. Cool. Agreed. There's a little bit of bookkeeping that I want to get into before we start talking about what's happening in town for the next uh, little bit of time. There was a gem that Trill found in uh, in the the communication chamber of this uh, wisp. I lied to you about what it was, and that now was so I'm mean. about to not lie to you about what that it is that, because thanks. you're back in town. You have time to identify what this is. That was so, so mean, Lars. It was it so was, mean. Yeah, I'm a bad person. We all know. That. I thought you did a great job of the shitty thing you did. I just want to say I mean, that's why, like, that made me even like matter because I really liked it. What you did. Um. Well, thank you. I'm sorry. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, that but is the, correct. Sir. Here's here's the deal with this with this gem. This gem is actually something called an elemental gem. Elemental gems are gems that you shout a trigger word crack it on the ground you throw it down on the ground and it summons an elemental that then fights for you there are multiple different colors of elemental gems that all summon different kinds of elementals this gem that you found is transparent meaning that it is a consumable that you shout out the name of an elemental lord which i don't know what that is let's just figure it out you it shatters Earth, and it summons wind, a fire there heart. you go if that's if that's how you want to do it you can do it that Trevor. way Trevor. But it summons a living whirlwind. So if you want to, you can and have a whirlwind pop out and fly all over the place and disrupt people. Or if you want to, you can sell it for a bunch of money. There's there's really just two. There are two potential uh, ways to go here. Um, but that's in your um, that's in your inventory right now, Robin. So so there you go. A living whirlwind, you said. A living whirlwind. Is that mindless? Could it be taken over by the wristband? 
Um, well, the bad news is that when you summon it, you already control it, so the wristband is, is uh, redundant. All right. Yeah, I'm sorry to say. Uh, there's something... Ao and Trill fighting over control of a living whirlwind, <laughs> and it just destroys the town. Exactly. Um, so that's that. That's that's, that's, that's what cool. you discover. This thing is. It's a pretty neat, pretty neat item. So we're we're picking up in the afternoon of Erastus the first. It's right around. Let's call it four p.m. The items that you are getting from uh, Mayor Os of Menhem as an exchange for freeing his daughter Doriana from the torment of the denizen of Lang is sand clear. Those items are all coming in on Erastus the 6th. So you have about five days before you get those items. So if people are interested in spending some downtime, uh, that's what we're that's what we're looking at. Zoe, I know that you had said you were interested in doing a little bit of retraining. Do we want to uh, pop into that and see what that looks like? Sure, sure. So Ao has also had um, what was it called? Biting, biting terror. Another tooth-based damage spell that was useless. What did we call that? Biting one? words. Biting words. That's right. It's the one that let me say things like "fuck" and "shit" and all those words that we're not <laughs> saying anymore because your children are listening and it upsets them. Um, Amazing. It upsets your cowardly children. It upsets your cowardly <laughs> children. Um, I think harnessing. The best Your children need to know that there are people like Zoe in the world who will say right. those words with no warning. No warning. <laughs> it's just going to fucking happen. <laughs> so harnessing, I think, maybe the, the best or at least strongest part of herself uh, that, that was leading her to biting words, uh, Ao has decided, I, I think she gets to town and maybe goes to Rin's... Um, I think the trip to Absalom was sort of like exciting for like jar jarring in a sort of invigorating way for her. Like she's more interested in being able to use not, not just display her illusions and swear a lot, but get others to do what she wants. Um, and so she is retraining biting words into command, which is a level one spell. Um, it's a level one spell, but let's just say it's a, it's a hell of a level one spell. Do you do you want to talk about it? Do you want me to talk about it? what do you or do you, what do you think? Why don't you? I've talked about the other ones. You talk about this one. Okay, so command is this level one spell that you it, it's it's got some guardrails on it, but you can command. All right, the you target. stop explaining it, and now I'm getting. No, I'm kidding. Okay, I'm good. Just practicing. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> oh, I get it. <laughs> um, so so it has like a it has a limited set of things that you can have you can make people do, but they're they're kind of good. Um, you can command the person to approach you, to run away, to release what it's holding, to drop prone, or to stand in place. And then depending on their on their uh, will save, they either do that not at all, or they do it a little bit, or they spend an entire turn doing it. I like to think I'll be able to put this to good use. I, it's also now occurring to me with the, um, what do we call it? Attack of Opportunity, Bow Chicka Wow Wow? Yes. That the, is like reactive strike. strike. Reactive strike. Wow. strike wow. Like I can wow. command them to take a step near Istan and Matt. Like it's like the applause thing, right? And like again, it will trigger this. So yes, I mean, and, then, and then we can fun. knock Sench them over so they're off guard for you. And I, then I mean, the, I, the thing that honestly got me reading the spell was just the ability to drop prone. It's like all those crit fail cards we've had to endure in our most ridiculous <laughs> fights. The idea that suddenly the monster is like a little turtle on its back. Um, um, is this essentially like the Bene Gesserit voice? Do it! <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, basically. <laughs> totally. Pull out your tooth and give it to me. Exactly, right. <laughs> <laughs> so again, hold Dark. on, guys. The things you can command are very specifically articulated, <laughs> but you can do, it. it is messed up. Pretty good. You cannot say rip out your tooth and give it to me. That's not, oh no, it is on the list of things. Zoe, did you edit this film? <laughs> I think of that as approach you for AO. Oh, I, just, I see, I, I yeah. see. What, when people are like, what's your approach? It's like, yeah. well, my approach is that I rip out I my rip tooth, out my and, tooth I and I offer it to somebody. And I give it to someone, yeah. Does anybody else have, have uh, let's, anything you guys want to do with these five days of downtime? Well, so Trill has a plan to buy a bunch of scrolls. 
Um, and so I imagine she actually wants to just earn a bit of income before then. Great. To Let's, make sure um, that she's not like wasting money when she okay. could have been earning some to buy those scrolls. So here's the deal. Do you know what skill you would like to earn income with? You can earn income with um, any lore. Uh, Performance. Okay. And then that's just a thing you can do. I guess that's just a thing you can do. Who's to say? <laughs> it kind of makes, I mean, busking is more straightforward yeah. than some of the ways yeah. you have to be like, I'm going to use society to make some you know, income. She comes back and she, you know, writes a song or two, um, singing about, and I lost my heart to a weird hot devil. <laughs> Both weird and hot. It's true. <laughs> he, he was both. Okay. I know. Like so, once I saw the picture more care more clearly on that someone posted on the Discord. Like, oh yeah, he's not as hot as it was when it was on like when it was weirdly small on my screen. But the, I'm still you know going what this trolls interpretation. You know what this reminds me of, and this is this is a digression that everybody's gonna love. It reminds me of the witches of Eastwick, where they talk about Jack Nicholson, who is at his most grotesque and disgusting in that movie like yeah. he is like gross like intentionally i'm not criticizing no his the, hair is like the long string and they're just totally entranced by him yeah and it's just pure confidence it's just like the context of what it is that he does he's like the devil he's the devil i'm sorry to spoil the witches of eastwick in which jack nicholson plays the devil it's but it's movie. like you see a photo of that guy. That's not going to put it across. And but it's when also, he's... um, it's Susan Sarandon, Cher, and Michelle Pfeiffer at like their absolute yes. hottest. They're so like, each of them beautiful. is in peak yeah, themselves. Out of yeah. control. <laughs> Susan Sarandon so is out of control in that movie. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, Sorry no, you had to see that. It's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I need to go rewatch that movie now. Thank you. That movie yeah, rules up until the at third act, and then it's kind of like, what? Are, wait, what's that? Why is this happening in this movie? Why are we doing this? The cherries. The, yeah, the cherries <laughs> is where they lose me. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So, so Trill, I'm going to uh, say that Trill has the opportunity to either attempt a more ambitious performance, playing a more difficult song, or is going to have the opportunity to go back to one of her old favorites to uh, to, to surface the mechanical thing. I'm, what I'm essentially offering you is a level 10 challenge or a level 7 challenge. Let's go for the level 10 challenge. Yeah, maybe she's like, she wants to demo her new song and she's really not sure how it's going to be um, received. Okay. So this is a little bit of a creative risk. What this means is that if you succeed or critically succeed, you're going to be able to make a, a lot of money for each of these days. If you critically fail, you are fired immediately. In the case of you as an independent contractor playing your own song, I'm gonna say that the audience makes you feel so bad about your song that you shelve it for the rest of the week. <laughs> uh, oh. And then we can try that level seven if you critically fail this Okay, this I'm, I'm here for it, let's do it. So, Trill, I, I feel like since she's a little unsure, she actually might go, um, maybe she's like down along the dock somewhere. She's not at her usual, like she hasn't taken the stage at Crook's Nook and she's trying some new chords with it that she hasn't used before. Um, so she starts, she gets out there and she starts playing uh, this new tune about the devil stole my heart. Okay, people start gathering around gradually over the course of the day. Let's see, or the course of the, the beginning of this performance, let's see how they react. Uh, is this secret? No. Okay, performance, let's see. So, I rolled 11, so that's a 31. That is a success. Whew. You okay. do competent cool. work. You gain the amount of currency listed for the task level and your proficiency rank. That means you get in your master in performance. Uh, in performance. Uh, I'm sure. Yeah, master. Are. Yeah, yeah. So master. you you gather. Uh, the audience loves it. They're they're entranced. They're taken away. They maybe they don't exactly start crying necessarily, but they are moved <laughs> by it, and they offer you at the end of the this performance for the day. You find six gold pieces in your uh, loot case or whatever. <laughs> so if you'd like to, you can keep that check and just ride it out for the rest of the uh, rest of these five days. If you would like, that would earn you a total of 30 gold pieces. 
And one scroll is how much? Well, it depends on the level, um, but scroll, sorry, it depends on the rank of, uh, yes, the of rank. a spell. Ooh, whoops, we've been saying the wrong word. Yeah, it's fine, who cares? But um, the, um, a, like a level, a, a rank four scroll costs 70 gold, a rank three scroll costs okay. 30 gold. Well, she's looking for a rank, some rank four scrolls. Okay. So let's let's try it again. Let's see what she gets the next day. Okay, so we see have four we days left, and we've added six gold pieces to your coffers so far. So Trill, you head back out, and you're you're seeing if you can find another gear in this yeah. song. And as a songwriter, I just want to say this is actually incredibly realistic. I think right. This is she's like kind of tight the tuning. See if that makes a difference. Maybe you tweaked the bridge a bit. And this one, I think she maybe tweaked it a little too much. Um, and she got a 26. That, my friend, is a failure. Oof. You do shoddy work. You screwed up this song. Nobody likes it anymore. You get the um, listed currency in the failure column for the task level. That's four silver okay. pieces. Ooh. But it's not a critical failure, right? So not she hasn't been. Not a critical been... failure. Okay. Okay, so let's try this again. Next day. Okay, it was one of the strings that was bad. She's changed one of the strings on her loot the next okay. day. So this is now day three of five. The last string was fine. It just rolled a one. Oh, no. <laughs> I should have kept the first roll. <laughs> You earn nothing for your work. The moment you bring this song back out, you've changed it again, and it's terrible now. You are fired immediately. You can't continue the task. Oh. Your reputation suffers, potentially making it difficult for you to find rewarding jobs in that community in the future. Oh, no. Where was it that you were performing again, <laughs> Trill? Uh, they put down the docks. So it looks like you got to let the docks yep. cool off for okay. a moment. And it looks like uh, she's shelving this song for a while. I yeah. really like the idea of people heckling Trill by yelling things like, stick to saving the town. <laughs> <laughs> Slay those monsters. Nobody cares about your devil infatuation. <laughs> he wasn't yeah, right. that The best hot. work was Courageous Anthem. Play Courageous <laughs> Anthem. Uh, um, so that level Play seven. the old stuff. That level Let's seven challenge is still on the table for days four and five. If you uh, like yeah, to let's do that. Try, check those so let's out. Let's still, still try and make some money. So she goes back to her. She goes back to courageous anthem. <laughs> okay. I believe in a thing called love. <laughs> a very difficult song to play for whatever <laughs> it really it's worth. <laughs> but let's see how Trill does with this more um, this more familiar tune. I think Trill's disheartened. Um, after these last few days, she failed again with a twenty-five. That's not a failure. For this oh, challenge. not with this lower one? Oh, yeah. good. That's fine. So you get, so, for this okay. final, for this uh, penultimate day, you manage to earn two gold and five silver. That's a bit better. And, and then last day, day, see how she does. See if the rolls get any better. So that's better. That's a 32. If I had gotten that all along, that would have been fine. <sighs> if that had been a 33, that would have been a critical success, <sighs> as it is. Still Trill success. walks away with a it's a it's a it's a learning time for for Trill as mm. she the pace maybe the pace of of performance is taking her a little bit of time to get back into after making this deal with a devil. Oh, Perhaps. that's the song she should have written. Deal with the devil. Like it's <laughs> on day five, like she hears someone kind of mutter that she's like, ah. Damn it, there's the song. <laughs> the devil went down to Atari and he was looking for a soul to steal. <laughs> he had a fight. He was in a bind because he was way behind. Yo, that's good. Let's uh let's work together on that one, Armand. All right, Charlie Daniels himself, Armand Humphreys. What are we we're talking about some spell stuff? What do you what are we doing? I don't even know what we're talking about. I don't even know how the mechanics for this work. Why don't you why don't you teach me? Yeah, so I, I'm looking at Nethys right now. Um, and so to learn the spell, you must do the following. Spend one hour per level of the spell, during which you must remain in conversation with the person who knows the spell or have the magical writing in your possession. Okay. Have materials with the price indicated in Table 4-3. Sure, um, love that table. One of my favorite tables in the book. 
it's hard to uh, be better than table four, three. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then uh, you have to do a skill check for the skill corresponding to your tradition, which in my case will be Arcana, and do a check against that DC, um, which is right. also listed on table four, three. One of the many reasons it's it's quite excellent. One of the, um, again, hard to beat table four, three. So, so tell me a story. What are you doing? What are you learning? What does it look like? Let's get a check going and let's spend some money. What yeah. Was, lead me, lead me down a path, please. Istin is looking to add a couple other cantrips for some ver versatility during the day, since those are often what he ends up relying on. I'd like to try and learn needle darts and slashing gust. And then I thought learning invisibility, a level two spell, Ooh. Um, could be fun because... I now have fourth level spell slots. And what happens at fourth level, if you upcast it, is that the invisibility does not end if you take a hostile action. And so I thought a permanently invisible AO for a fight could be uh, our kind of Trixie. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Fabulous. Yeah, I'm relieved to hear it. Um, and so for a first or cantrip uh, level that's two gold, so that would be four gold total. And then a second level spell, which invisibility is, that's six gold for a total of 10 gold. Um, All right, I'm debiting it. And his magical shorthand also reduces the time necessary. It's 10 minutes per spell rank. So this could all kind of be one day. Yeah, this is, um, this is brunch that you're describing right now. <laughs> exactly. Let's roll some dice. What are we doing? Okay, here we go. First arcana roll for a cantrip. Uh, 32. Oh, you did beat a 15 with your 32. Phenomenal. Yeah. You learned the spell. It was close. It Oof. was close. They had us in the uh, first on, half, I'm not going to lie. Yeah, tenter hooks the whole time. Uh, let's try this for the second one. Great. 31. Okay, cool. All right. That's great. And uh, for invisibility. Uh, 36. Great. So, so what this means is that, um, is that Istin spends the better part of an afternoon, I guess, just like speed reading these, these magical, uh, texts and, uh, who do you find? To, so it says you have to like find somebody who knows the spell or, or whatever. How do, how are we resolving that? Yeah. I was wondering if he like goes over to Morlebent and Carl's cause, um, Morlebent's a wizard, right? Or is it Carl? He is, yeah. He is. And he definitely has uh, scrolls, if that's helpful at all. But ching ching, the bell rings. Istin steps in, and Morlebent is like, No, oh, I'm, I'm beyond happy to talk to you about uh, the various spells that are available. Uh, you know, uh, being able to share my knowledge with the the, the heroes of, of Otari is, is uh, certainly of, of great interest to me. And he happily teaches you these spells. And there's a awesome. montage. Uh, Carl is rolling his eyes uh, in the background of right. the montage, and it's phenomenal. Istin just can't get it to work. Like, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Morlebent slaps minutes. Istin across the face, <laughs> and Istin suddenly turns invisible. He's gotten it now. <laughs> My God, you mean the invisibility with his inside me the whole time? <laughs> um, Carl rolls his eyes in the background. Um, you see the the clo the signs uh, on the door to the store shift from open to closed, and you have learned these spells. Awesome. Thank you. These are going to be fun to play with. The real invisibility was the friends you made along the way. Do we have anything else we want to talk about during this downtime? Uh, Mag would like to move the resilient armor rune. I'm guessing that's a day of crafting. It's a day of crafting, and it's going to be a little bit of a difficult check because this is a um, pretty high-level rune. Okay. You have to spend 34 gold, which you have, in order to transfer the rune. Like, it takes 34 gold of materials stuff, to, like, yeah. hammer, to hammer the rune over. Yeah. And this is an 8th-level rune, which means that this DC is going to be a DC 24 crafting check okay. for Matt. Could any of us... I guess none of us have helpful crafting, let's be honest. Oh, Istin has that pretty good. He could aid, and he's got the cooperative soul thing, so could, he could definitely... Yeah. 
turn the rune invisible and not invisible in a really unhelpful move. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, strobing <laughs> rune. That's the kind of stratagem that you can look forward to Ao sharing. That's uh, right. That's right. You get to roll on. twice with that. Could, could like Ao to... come over and summon a gallery of people to cheer Mag right. on? Yes, you got it, girl. <laughs> All good. that does mechanically is make the area yeah, difficult to move around in. <laughs> right. So. <laughs> uh, I like to think that Mag is finally getting a rune of one's own. Oh. <laughs> yeah. uh, hey. uh, yep. I like Episode it. title. Get scratch that down. On the second of Erastus, you're able to get Istan's aid. Do you want to spend some time on that first day, um, David, before you're able to get that aid? What do you think? No. Uh, Mag will take the day off. Okay. Because huh. she and I are both working on how to do that. <laughs> Creating boundaries? <laughs> yeah. Mag and I will try and create some boundaries. Okay. So she's going to... She's going to go to the library. She's going to realize that she forgot her laptop charger, is what happened to me the last time I went to the library. She'll go get a okay. snack. Uh, she'll feel really guilty as she's doing it because she has food at home. She'll head home. She'll pick up her charger. No, this, no, doesn't, this doesn't sound, sound as relaxing quite as, as healing as I was. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, was it say. never is, Lars. It never is. And that's why you Fair should enough. just stay home and get things done. <laughs> Again, I'm not sure that we've learned the lesson, but well, let's see what happens. If on it's this a choice between day. being totally unrestored but having some more things done, or totally unrestored and being yet one more day behind, you tell me. Um, no, Mag. I uh, Mag. I will not tell you. Goes to the park and uh, <laughs> does push-ups. No, no, Mag. Don't, don't do that. Just uh, no. She goes out into the woods, which is where she's happiest. She communes with with nature. Uh, she refocuses. So the day after that, Mag re-naturized and ready to focus on the hard work of spending eight hours trying to move this magical rune with the aid of Isthen. Yeah, so I imagine that... Um, and Mag, and Mag has been doing her crafting in, I want to say, like the back lot of what used to be Carmen Rajani's smithy. So I imagine that when Isthen meets Mag there, Mag takes the opportunity to revisit. I not really thought about this before, but Isthen, you won't have, have you, have you been to this place before, this forge? No. Is there anything special about it or anything? For many years, all through my childhood, and until just a few weeks ago, this shop was run by Carmen Rajani. Until he became one of the threats we needed to address. His theft of the ancestral sword from the Dawnflower Library. His misanthropy growing. We confronted him in a cave outside town. And for a moment, it looked as though the best thing for it was to dispatch him entirely. Vadim, who I wish you could have known, he tried to find redemption in anyone. But Carmen, he took that second chance and he tossed it on the pyre. And as she says this, Mag shovels another load of coal into the forge that's heating. And it, as she starts, you know, saying all this stuff, Istin starts pinching at the bridge of his nose. I don't care who he was, what choices he squandered, what he has experienced in the days since we've abandoned him to hell. He has faced real torture. I'm not talking about like emotional torture, although I'm sure they include that as well. But 
being burnt, being physically maimed, only to be restored to health to be done again and again and again. Is someone on the margins of society who can't see outside their own passions and obsessions really a person that is so different and impossible for you to understand, Magdaruna? Huh? I mean, we walked in there, right? And yeah, Euravian made a show of force. You know, having the bearded devils there, but... We had systematically destroyed every bit of his operation on that level. Why do you think he wanted to talk to us? He wasn't talking to us because... He was a cool guy, although I mean, he had his moments. He I really mean, those did. <laughs> like you really have to have some true. sort of infernal focus to achieve that definition. Kind of elemental magnetism. Yeah, I, I hear you. But my point is, when we walked in there, we were negotiating from a position of strength. He was talking to us. Because he didn't have the resources to fight us any longer. That was a setting of the terms of his surrender. And we decided that in the course of an afternoon, we would accomplish for him what he had not in centuries been able to do. So that rather than fighting him, finishing that scourge and threat to Absalom and an Otari, we gave him a victory. We gave him a complete victory. And I, I just, I just keep seeing that poor dumb bastard's face, you know, it just, it was too fucking drunk and stupid to know what was happening to him. He wasn't even upset, he just, He just didn't understand. By now, the metal in the forge has heated and Mag has withdrawn it. She's begun to hammer and is hammering rhythmically, sparks flying off the forged metal as she listens to Isthen. Let's get an aid check from Isthen then as this... This inten the intensity of the conversation potentially helps pour some energy into the uh, work that they're doing. 17, but he gets a plus four to that for a 21 to help. That's a success. So Mag is going to get a plus one thanks to thanks to Istin. So perhaps this conversation is is it's too contentious. It's it's not quite exactly what Mag needed. It is pushing her forward, but it is not exactly what she wanted to hear, perhaps. Um, and Mag says, as the, as the, she continues to strike hammer against Anvil, well, perhaps understanding the betrayal of his bloodline to this town, perhaps being from out here, Perhaps it's less clear to city folk. And that is a 25. Okay, with the plus one, that's a 26. Big, big, huge roll from Mag. And you have successfully transferred this rune over to your, your main squeeze, your cold iron breastplate. And as the sun sets on this day, it's, there's potentially some unresolved tension between the two of you, but you do manage to get the job done. And I think um, I think by way of a, a kind of peace offering after this ongoing difficult moral debate, Mag asks Isthen to accompany her across town first to the Dawnflower Library to return Carmen Rajani's 
ancestral blade, which she has taken and recovered from him before handing him off to Uravian and returning it to its place on display in the library's atrium. And I think then over um, a flagon or two of mulled wine, um, Mag and, and Vandy work to give Isthen more of a sense of who the Rajani's have always been in the history of the town, what what Carmen's place in the sort of community firmament should have been, and what a what a a letdown and a betrayal it was um, that Carmen failed to live up to the family name and instead devoted his life to these small minded and selfish ends. And I think during this whole lecture Isthin's arms are kind of crossed because I'm not sure he's buying what they're selling. A few days after this rift starts to form within the party, you get a message. Each of you, one by one, sees Mark your friend at the city guard, at the town guard. Mark, just to set the stage here, since we've never talked about this before, Mark is a, he's a young man with a sort of curtain of dark hair over, spilling over his forehead. Imagine a pump up the volume era Christian Slater (laughs) <laughs> or maybe a oh, River's yes. Edge era Crispin Glover. I feel very powerfully right now. He but Mark. bursts in, interrupting what you're doing and says, they're, they're, they're here. The, the Star Watch. They're here. You have to come with me. And we will pick up <gasps> from there. Next time. <sighs> Istin's going to totally fanboy out. Oh my god, I can't believe they're here! <laughs> Star I, Watch, Star Watch. I had all your action figures when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> I made a doll of you. Okay, that's kind of weird to say, but I did! <laughs> Ruin is a tabletop gold production produced under the Paizo Incorporated Community Use Policy using trademarks and copyrights owned by Paizo that are covered under that policy. Paizo does not recognize, endorse, or sponsor this project in any way, and we are expressly prohibited from charging you to use or access this content. For more information about Paizo Inc. and Paizo products, visit paizo.com. All original characters and content in the Roots of Ruin are the property of Tabletop Gold, and all rights are reserved. We at Tabletop Gold would love to hear from you. On our website, tabletopgold.com, you can learn more about us and our shows, pick up great merch, and connect to the best online community in all of podcasting. Thanks for listening.